Hello and welcome back. I'm Dr. Mark D. Baldwin and today's lecture is on Henry David Thoreau. Much of what I talked about in the Ralph Waldo Emerson lecture and the Romanticism and Transcendentalism lectures applies to Thoreau as well. So please consider those remarks applicable here. In fact, Emerson was Thoreau's mentor of sorts until a student surpassed the teacher, in one sense at least. Emerson talked about how to live differently, while Thoreau went out and did it by living a Spartan existence in the woods for two years, an experience he chronicled in his masterpiece, Walden. He was, thus, more of a practitioner than a philosopher, believing that America's promise was as yet unrealized. Thoreau went to live near Walden's Pond as an action based on principle so that he could get closer to nature. The book is full of correspondences meant to instruct the reader in how to live a more meaningful life. Very romantic. The lessons of Walden are solipsistic, teaching that we must perceive everything as a reaction to our own personal responses. It's also narcissistic in that Thoreau sits meditating for long periods of time on the banks of the pond, contemplating his mantra, concluding that human activity is futile. Without the transcendent spirit and transparent eyeball of the oversoul. Walden is structured in three distinct ways. First it's chronological as a diary or journal of Thoreau's two years there. Secondly, it's rhetorical as an argument for adopting his philosophy and lifestyle. And third, it's mythical as it's a quest for a rebirth into a more enlightened state of mind and being. Thoreau looked at the world with an innocent eye, attempting to see without looking. Striving to recover the lost child that I am, Thoreau sought to cultivate a childlike mind, believing that on each morning one should start anew his quest for truth. The movie Groundhog Day is an exercise in Thoreau's transcendental revisionism. As Thoreau puts it, it is only when we forget all our learning that we begin to know. The highest wisdom does not inspect, but behold. This frame of mind is perfectly illustrated by Walt Whitman in his superb little poem to a learned astronomer. Like any good romanticist, Thoreau believed in pursuing his own path on the journey to discover his own divinity. For Thoreau, God is within your soul and in nature. The grand irony is that the more we seek ourselves and our individuality, the more we come to believe in the collective unconsciousness of humanity. As Thoreau said, if I seem to boast more than is becoming, my excuse is that I brag for humanity rather than for myself. That's a statement that also sounds straight out of Walt Whitman, who, as I'm suggesting, was greatly influenced by Emerson, Thoreau, and transcendental thought. Perhaps the essence of Thoreau's philosophy is the notion that we should live more simple lives. Our life is frittered away by detail. Simplify, simplify, he urged. Men, he believed, have become tools of their tools. In proportion as he simplifies his life, the laws of the universe will appear less complex, and solitude will not be solitude, nor poverty, poverty, nor weakness, weakness. A strong case could be made for Thoreau's enormous influence on the era of modernism, which was coming along toward the end of the 19th century. Thoreau believed in simply stating the facts, for reality is fabulous. Like Whitman and the modernists, Thoreau wrote paratactically, eschewing formal structure and setting down impressions in random order. His writings were excursions. And also like Whitman and the modernists, he preferred writing in the first person singular to capture the immediacy of the experiencing ego the seeing individual eye. One of the most influential pieces of writing in world history, Thoreau wrote Civil Disobedience to chronicle his protest of three things, the Mexican War, slavery, and taxes. 
He refused to pay taxes in protest of the Mexican War and slavery. As a result, he was put in jail for a night or two. And it didn't seem to bother him a bit. In fact, he concluded and insisted that it is a man's duty to break the law with which he disagrees, but to do so in a nonviolent manner. This principle of nonviolent civil disobedience was embraced by two of the 20th century's most powerful figures, Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., who led the Indian people and the American blacks, respectively, in their quest for civil rights and true freedom from oppression. Both Gandhi and King cited Thoreau as one of their main inspirations in life. A somewhat sad and perplexing question is whether or not Thoreau's brand of reclusive protest is practical or even relevant for us today. Not many of us can afford to go to jail for our principles. It just doesn't look good on a job resume. Nor can we take two years off to live in a cabin in the woods communing with the raccoons and possum. And it's easy to say simplify, simplify, but in today's world, those who cannot multitask and who aren't able to manipulate a multitude of duties and skill sets find themselves on the unemployment line more often than not. It would be nice to chuck it all and grab a fishing pole, but bills and responsibilities don't allow such a luxurious permanent vacation. So, Thoreau's theories are great to help us balance things out, though they are likely impossible to completely adopt. Well, thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.